Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this closing uh, plenary um, of this uh, World Economic Forum <laughs> summit sure. meeting on Europe and Central Asia. Um, I'm delighted that we have such a good turnout uh, towards the end of what I know has been a very busy um, and uh, intellectually stimulating uh, set of, uh, of meetings over this last two days, this day and a half. Um, the last plenary, as you might expect, uh, is going to try to bring together some of the main lessons learned, some of the main insights um, that have been pulled together over the last couple of days. It's under the title Unlocking Europe and Central Asia's Potential. Um, perhaps self-evidently this meeting is on the record of this discussion, but I think it's always good to uh, remind especially our people uh, in government um, of that uh, fact. Um, and we're going to be talking, uh, trying to draw together this theme that I think has underpinned the whole last day and a half of expanding the frontiers of innovation. Innovation, um, however it's defined, and I know there are many definitions, but innovation as a driver of competitiveness and, and of growth over the long term uh, in a way that is uh, sustainable. We are fortunate to have uh, a super panel uh, of five individuals, including two of the four co-chairs um, of this uh, forum session with us uh, to close. Um, uh, Bozidar Jilic, um, who is on my on the far side, on my left there, Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration, also Minister of Science and Technological Development um, of Serbia. Um, and I'll be turning to him first when we start. Uh, we have uh, then Eva Dihand. Um, to his, uh, to Mr. Well, to the left as I'm moving towards me here on the stage, um, who is publisher and CEO of Hoyte, which is uh, the largest free distribution newspaper here in Austria. I think over half a million um, uh, readers uh, day on day, and a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Mm. Um, we have uh, our minister from uh, Kazakhstan, Mr. Karat Kelembetov, Minister of Economic Development and Trade of Kazakhstan, and one of our four co-chairs uh, of the session here, and somebody who, although has a government uh, title, has also worked um, as Chief Executive Officer of Sovereign Wealth Fund of Kazakhstan, and brings a, a crossover from the ministerial side as well to um, the government side. Um, we have Connie Hedegaard, uh, the Commissioner um, for Climate Action uh, at the European Commission in Brussels, but I think you all know here, uh, Connie Hedegaard as well was Minister of Environment, uh, Minister of Climate and Energy um, in the Danish government uh, for a number of years, running right up through 2009. Um, so has been right in the thick of those uh, debates. And then we have uh, Jim Snaber, uh, the co-CEO of SAP Germany and also uh, co-chair of the World Economic Forum uh, here for this meeting. Um, mm -hmm. If I could turn uh, to each of our speakers and give them a chance to think through here. We have um, a, a series of discussions that have taken place across these last two days that have touched on I think three principal themes. How do you drive competitiveness? Uh, and there are a number of uh, probably diverse and even nation-specific sets of solutions to that question. And when we talk about Europe and Central Asia, that obviously is a very broad uh, uh, church of, of experiences we're going to be able to draw upon. Secondly, though, I know a big theme here has been resources where do resources fit into innovative growth? And not just oil, gas, food, but human resources, human capital. And this will be a second theme I think we want to make sure we draw out in the conversations and with you when we turn to discussion from the floor um, uh, in a few minutes. And finally, building in resilience, uh, a main uh, experience and contribution, I think, of the World Economic Forum has been this fo focus on risk, risk resilience, risk preparation. And we know that over the last couple of days we've talked about the kind of geopolitical risks that hit us from left field, uh, the Arab uh, uprisings and the Arab Spring. Um, but we've also had supply chain unexpected risks with uh, the events in Japan, uh, but also as I think our corporate uh, members here will occasionally remind us, you might sometimes have uh, a regulatory unexpected risk that could crop up in response to a particular evolving technology. So I want to make sure that we have those three big themes underlying our questions. Um, and let me start off right away, uh, Mr. Jelic, with you. Um, from your experience, as I said, you're somebody who has a government position, but you've worked at 
McKinsey or Harvard MBA, um, somebody again who brings a, a dual experience. As you think back over the agenda of this World Economic Forum Summit, and you think about the challenges to innovation, the challenges to growth, whether at this resources level, at the competitive level, where do you see those standing out most prominently? Uh, hello to all. Uh, since you asked us to take our vantage point, so I'm not going to talk to the to the generality because our region, Europe and Central Asia, is, is quite heterogeneous. Uh, I've been trying for the past few years to see if there is uh, a future in the innovation economy for the small guys. The question is, in the time of the flat world of the internet, of Thomson Reuters databases uh, showing very transparently who knows what in the world among the scientists and the engineers, can you find the space between United States, Germany, and China. Can you, and Serbia is a 35 billion euro uh, GDP and seven and a half million inhabitants, is there a space for the small and the medium guys uh, in that space? That's a, a very difficult question because on one side you have the rich and demographically challenged West, for instance, Germany will need uh, in the next decade to import about 400,000 scientists and engineers to make up for the lack of uh, uh, fertility of the baby boom generation. And on the other hand, you have huge increases in the budgets uh, of China, but also the Middle East. Um, uh, last year, for instance, we started to see some of our top scientists leaving for Qatar. So. Uh, that's, I think, the challenge. The most valuable assets for most of the countries are not all gas and metals. We, all, we are not all having that. The most and the only valuable resource is people. No. And the most valuable part of that resource is the most mobile one. And how do you, in a winner-take-all economy, where Facebook and others with a few thousand people have a market cap of a few hundred, a few dozen, a few hundred uh, billion, uh, US dollars, how do you hang on to at least part of the talent and have it produced for your country and not for some other countries? But, but just quickly on this point, do you, uh, when you say this is the biggest challenge, especially uh, interesting for small countries, most countries are small countries. Yes. Uh, we mm -hmm. tend to talk about the big ones. Mm -hmm. um, you're in the uh, applying uh, and in the track for, for joining the EU. Do you see that as, as, as providing um, uh, a sense of scale for small countries, uh, a sense of, 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 of an ability to leverage, therefore, that potential much more strongly, and being outside at the moment is a key disadvantage, or the fact that you're on the track for potential uh, membership is, is a positive. Where does the EU help or not help on that business of being a small guy? Uh, with some experience now, help yourself and Europe will help you. <laughs> In other words, uh, it's not enough. It's both ways. Uh, in December 2009, you know, in the Balkans, because what thing, what, whatever happened, people tend to have this black humor. So we had a visa-free travel. And some people said, don't do that because everybody will leave. Well, it's the opposite. Uh, equalizing the conditions of life is actually providing additional reasons for people to stick where they are, including the most talented people. Yeah. To be mobile, but not to emigrate. Yeah. Now, of course, on the other hand, there is a little bit of uh, co-opetition. Everybody will be competing for the same brains. And so if you're small, you better be very focused on what you can achieve and not to pretend to be able to cover as much as the big ones. And therefore, the focus and the very strong implementation is something that is uh, even more important for the small nations than it is for the big ones. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Connie Hedegaard, let me turn to you. you. You bring a dual experience, obviously having been a national minister, but now the commission. Uh, where would you put that central set of challenges to the kind of innovative change? Thank you, Robin. I think that the main challenge is that Europe will have to speed up the way we innovate, the way we do our reforms, the way we make the necessary transition. Historically, we have been second to none when it comes to innovation. We are very, very good and very creative. We are good at innovation. But we can just see that our competitors in other regions, they have one big advantage. They are very, very fast. When they decide to do something, they actually do it. So I would say our main challenge right now, when we also have this economic crisis, 
which of course is very, very concrete and tangible for policymakers and business people. But that is, we do not have five or ten years to drag our feet. The, the world is transforming now, and geostrategically, if we want to stay as the world's largest economy, we want to have this political impact as well, we must be much faster. We cannot compete when it comes to wages, taxes, retirement, age, you know, there are many parameters where we cannot compete. Uh, but we can compete on innovation, on creativity. I also, of course, believe that we should, be, be, we should hold our position as being the best to become energy and resource efficient. I believe that the, one of the key parameters, competitive-wise, for the future, that would be in a world where raw materials prices will increase, energy prices will increase, to be the most energy and resource efficient economy that will be a competitive asset. And I think we have a big challenge there to keep our front-runner position. And now that you've made this transition from, let's say, national government into uh, a supranational structure, do you see governments grasping that sense of urgency? And if not, is that perhaps the biggest challenge, that governments in a way are so focused on their internal changes that the ability to work together to speed up, because obviously a lot of the regulation in the EU is pan-EU, um, is this a problem? Yeah, that is a big challenge. And also right now, governments, ministers, heads of states, I mean, they have a lot on their plate. So that, of course, is one challenge. And it's also a challenge that pol politics often tend to be marked by short-termism. But I would say at one more aspect. I think their business could be more helpful. There is a tendency that business will always defend that things should stay as they are. I think one of the biggest tools we have had in Europe, that is standardization, regulation, stay, making f uh, stable frameworks for the market to function. But we need more than just the market because there is a, an urgency here. There is a time factor. And there we also need business to help provide the good business cases, to help show that, for instance, if we are energy efficient, that is a job-creating machine. Some have seen that already. But what about the rest? And what about the organized business interests? Are they pushing enough in the right direction? There I think business and politics together could try to move forward with a big, better pace. Well, we'll come around, I think, to a business perspective uh, in a couple of minutes, and uh, let's see if you're seen as part of the obstacle and a challenge or part of the answer. Let me turn now to, to Karat Kilimbetov. Uh, Minister, uh, this is perhaps a, a kind of West European or a Central European uh, conversation. Do you see very much the same sorts of challenges, or how does it look from, from Kazakhstan? Uh, yes, we discussed yesterday, and I would like to repeat a little bit. Uh, when we talk about the countries uh, with uh, reach of natural resources. So usually we are thinking about this is oil curse. It's a problem. And uh, so how you really could uh, develop or be innovative if, if you just sell the oil and so and that's the end of the story. And a lot of the uh, issues like the Dutch disease, the let's say appreciation of uh, uh, exchange rate, it's, uh, it's not help to the economy from one side. And the country without the natural resources is usually more innovative. Is there any successful story in Europe <laughs> for Kazakhstan? Yes, there is a successful story of Norwegian economy. So they did a great job in terms of not only increasing the role of oil factor in the economy, but also to create something uh, really sophisticated. I mean, this is like oil and gas service industry, petrochemical, and managing by oil wells. Uh, you know that no Norwegians create the special fund where we sterilize all this money and put it outside of the budget in order to live without oil factor in the budget planning. We did the same in Kazakhstan. We create reserve fund, national fund. We exclude all oil revenues from the budget. We are not oriented for the big prices in oil in the budget. All these oil revenues moving over there. That's help us in order to manage overheating. So the, 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 the unpredictability of the prices, the movement of the prices, you're trying to make sure that that is not yes. a risk and a challenge for Absolutely. the long term. Yeah? So this is the first part of the responsible macroeconomic policy. From the other side, we understand we should diversify our economy. We should create something new, which is uh, definitely uh, everyone wants to create Google. But uh, to be realistic, it should be related to the, somehow to your competitive advantage. For example, if we have a raw materials uranium, even after Fukushima, I would like to say about it. 
and we France anyway uh, wants to uh, import it the uh, uranium. We agreed, for example, with French Arriva to export to China not only the raw materials but some kind of the, uh, the nuclear tablets or the part of the uh, components of the fuel. This is very high tech. When we talk about uranium and oil, there are a lot of stereotypes. This is not high tech. It's uh, the most high, uh, capital and uh, uh, intellectual property intensive areas is related to the natural resources. And we want to create GV in Kazakhstan with our partners in order to develop some part of this service or downstream in Kazakhstan with the local content, with the local engineers, with the local uh, uh, training force. And I think this is uh, also one of the opportunities to really be innovative in Kazakhstan. However much we try and talk about challenges with Central Asia, it's opportunities. This is maybe one of the contrasts of the sort of dichotomy of some of this discussion. Mr. Snava, let me uh, turn to you now um, for, a, let's say, a business perspective on this. I mean, companies constantly have to innovate. Perhaps they're in a more competitive environment in some ways than countries. We, we, countries come to crises, and then, but you have to do it on a much more uh, steady uh, state uh, set of evolution. What, what were the biggest challenges from your standpoint? No, well, first of all, um, I will just uh, confirm that without innovation, companies don't survive long term. And uh, in a world with a resource constrained situation, I don't think we will be able to generate the growth that we all have ambitions for, both as countries as well as companies, unless we dramatically focus on innovation to drive a sustainable long term growth uh, scenario. Now, innovation is a, is a big word, and I think we define it many times different ways. So when you talk about the challenges, let me try and define innovation the way we look at it. Um, people sometimes confuse innovation with creativity, and, and then they define innovation as converting money into ideas. Um, uh, I actually believe that true innovation is about converting ideas into money, i.e. having an impact in this world that is valuable. Um, and only then do you have real innovation and not just creativity. And so what does it take and what is the biggest challenge from my perspective in being truly innovative? Well, it requires the combination of those two things, generating great ideas and then being able to scale the right ideas. And if I look at Europe, I would say because of our diversity, we have lots of great ideas, but we are not good enough in scaling them. Many of the great ideas get bought early by some American company and soon some Chinese company and then they scale there. And we have multiple examples of that in the past. So the question is, diversity gives us generation of ideas. But how can we as a region become significantly better in scaling because that's when true innovation happens. That's when value is generated from ideas and that's where I would agree with Connie. We need a a wake-up call in the European um, opportunity here, add to our diversity benefit, the ability to scale, which is, I believe, the biggest challenge we have. But therefore, the underlying challenge from a government standpoint is the lack of what, commonality of standards, this is regulatory blockages. What, what's, how does the problem manifest itself? I understand the theory, but how does the problem manifest itself at SAP? Well, um, I, I actually believe that we need to create an environment that fosters small entrepreneurial uh, companies to, to be able to get global much faster. And, and so I don't believe in centralization being the right answer. Normally centralization kills the innovation but is great at scaling. Um, on the other side, if you only decentralize, you will have the same innovation done many times right. and no one is scaling. So is there a way to do both? I believe in the power of platforms, and, 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 and it's, it's maybe a generic concept, but take the internet as a good example of a platform. The internet is a platform that defines certain ways that computers um, communicate with each other and can become relevant and integrating of everyone in the world. And because of that platform, it enabled an unbelievable level of decentral um, innovation to happen. We're seeing it now again and again, a, a Facebook platform, the Apple idea of the App Store and 300,000 apps built in record time. No one company can do that. So is there a chance to use the platform thinking and maybe instead of regulating ourselves with centralized things that take too long, um, 
use the central power to create platforms that inspire for decentralized innovation and scale. Yes, so to think of the EU as a platform in essence, which would mean letting go of some of the more nationalist competitive elements that exist within it, but nonetheless, this would be a message from you as, as a company, clearly. Eva de Khan, let me turn to you. Um, startup business, I mean, you've created one in that sense. Uh, what have been the biggest challenges, or if you take your own experience and you spread them out a little bit, what do you think we're facing that's, that's blocking us from that kind of innovative growth? Well, maybe, you know, media is like a very special segment because it's on one side, it's a normal business for us, for the owners, but on the other side, it's maybe one of the strongest drivers of democracy, very important. Um, and it's maybe everywhere in the world the same that um, politicians in the north, in the south and in the east don't like um, too strong media, which is especially in Eastern European countries sometimes a problem. It's Today, when you like found a new daily newspaper, you will need about 70 to 100 million in a country like Austria, only 8 million people. Yeah? Then you invest this, you need a lot of structure, and then um, they start threatening journalists. As we all know the problems from foreigners investing, but also in the countries, like it's happening to the Dogan family now in Turkey. And I think it needs from politicians a very liberal-minded, um, uh, how do you say, to allow also media to grow, I mean mass media. Um, but I think in these countries there will be the step much faster. To make the long story short, um, it's as we saw in Egypt, it's the new media that's not so intensive in investment. It's more from the public ground growing and this is, uh, will make a lot of change. I mean, you see in China even they, they deblock it or they don't allow Google um, to, to make their platforms. But I think this will be a new form of media and there will be much more innovative and in the Western European countries where the, all the big publishing groups are not making any money online, they all do it with the old media. And in these countries, I think it's a big chance because it's also for the population a, a chance to, to consume media. Yeah. Certainly, strikes me media is probably an area that's going through some of the deepest change yeah. at the moment, some of the big yeah. established broadsheets and so on, struggling for new business models, etc. Yeah. So I think how governments adapt them will be important. Let me, let me turn a little bit to, uh, to some of the, the good news stories, because one can always end these conferences thinking about all the problems and the challenges. Uh, but Bozidar, if you were to think a little bit about some success stories, places where uh, perhaps innovation has been allowed to flourish, either again in a national perspective or other perspectives you bring, what lessons can we take away from success as opposed to from challenges? Well, uh, maybe continuing on the, on the same stride, uh, speaking of the small, on, the, on behalf of the smaller non-natural uh, uh, resources rich countries, uh, at the end of the day, if you think about uh, what, how you can reach success in this very challenging international sphere, you can write strategies, you can think about picking the fields where you can compete, you can think about competitiveness. As you said, I was many years uh, also a management consultant. But at the end of the day, I think the most uh, likely route to success is to support the most talented people you have. And then provide them support, which is not only money, it has to do by protecting them from jealousy and mediocrity. Because it is not so automatic that people will come and say, well, I like that uh, person because uh, he or she has shown a lot of talent. In fact, I've seen that my role in government is as much protecting them from the mediocrity and the jealousy of others as it is to give them support and resources. I'll give you two examples. It took us five years to get one of the top ten stem cell scientists who is from Serbia but did his career in um, mostly United Kingdom and also Spain to come back and it was really providing him now about 10 million euro to create in Kragujevac, where he found a, a joint venture with the local university to have a stem cell research center, uh, but also allowing him to be able to provide his maximum in the country. And now it is his turn to create, and it's Professor Stojkovic, it is up to him now on the basis of this to attract other people and to create the critical mass and movement for that type of idea. I'll give you another example. 
uh, I was thinking how can we collaborate with big Germany? Because Germany uh, is, a, is both an opportunity for us and it's a challenge. I already talked about it. It's really simple. Is I go and talk to the institutions that are taking our best people and try to strike a deal with them, be it Fraunhofer, be it Max Planck and others, why not open in Serbia? It's going to be cheaper for you and we keep the people. And then thinking how we can collaborate, same, really just the simple thinking, uh, we don't have many successful uh, Serbian people in uh, German tech. We have one, let's say, who was in 2006 the top tech entrepreneurs, Professor Illich. Then Illich, he was the CEO of Varta Batteries and then ARI, which is digital imaging. And frankly, the whole of this relationship, I said, well, Dan, you, 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 you decide. Mm. And we found one topic, which is because we have been producing physical chemists for some time, not really knowing why, frankly, <laughs> because it used, it used to be during the time of socialism. Germany and other countries stopped producing physical chemists because chemists went into bio, and lo and behold, suddenly we had three to four hundred scientists. We do not really want to know what to do with them, but now for lithium battery, which is critical for electrical mobility, they are very interesting. So we took them, we put a wrapper around them, we gave it to them to run, and now we are very attractive to Germany. It's interesting because we, there was a poll done, which I'll refer to in a minute, um, a Facebook poll done by the World Economic Forum in the lead up to this, although I think you've probably heard it to a number of the panels, but this one as well, where somebody wrote in uh, to support entrepreneurial culture as their main driver for innovation and growth. But they said, you know, everyone who thinks education and skills are the missing link clearly doesn't know the region. There's plenty of skills, plenty of talent in education. What we're missing is that entrepreneurial culture, that space to be able to take the idea and make the money out of it. So I think that's a little bit what I uh, heard your point being there. Um, if I could turn to you, uh, Connie Hedegaard, now on, on, again, looking for an opportunity now that you've sat within the commission, one can usually uh, describe it as a place that's dealing with problems, but are you seeing any forward movement, any successful steps towards that kind of change you were describing in your opening remarks? What can we, what can we be hopeful about? Well, sometimes, you know, when you look at these challenges and say, why are things not moving? It sometimes helps to step back a bit. And then there are huge successes there. I mean, the whole single market, we take it for granted now, it's a huge success. The thing that we are cooperating on standards, it's a, it's a huge benefit for, for companies. When we are trying to say to the car manufacturers of Europe, here are the standards, it can drive innovation and it can do it on one platform. It, it, it benefits their market penetration will be faster and so on and so forth. I think we in Europe have a very good uh, tradition for public-private partnerships. We could do better there. But I think that there are also some good lessons to be learned. By the way, I also think that during the crisis, what we did in the recovery program, where we, for instance, said, why don't we Europeanize our energy systems much more? That is also a success story. It's not the end of that story. We are doing it right now. But basically, we are lessening the vulnerability of the individual country and acting more as Europe. I think that is also a success story. And has the target setting that the EU is engaged in on climate targets and yeah. renewable targets, efficiency targets, are these creating a platform effect? Is yes. It it is. Europe is the only economy in the world who has actually decoupled economic growth from a resource use. We can do more, make more growth, and then use less energy. And that is also related not only to standards, but also to our tradition of setting targets. And it keeps the focus of governments. Also, in times that are difficult, for instance, why is it that we have a lot of governments right now still focusing on renewables and expanding in renewables? That's because we are binding targets. Then the counter argument would be, well, fine that we have that in Europe, but what about the rest of the world? Would they follow? Actually, three years ago, when we set the binding targets for energy and climate, we were alone. Today, more than 90 countries, 90 countries worldwide, have mm. set their domestic targets. And I also think we have a very good tradition in our pricing system, mm -hmm. not only in the emissions trading, but also in other ways where we are pricing energy consumption. And by the way, I think that is one of the things we have to see more of in the future, that we will tax less what we earn, we will tax more what we burn. We will tax resources and energy and consumption more and labor 
less because that will also help our competitiveness. And, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kalimbetov, you, you gave an optimistic uh, take on my challenges. Let, let me flip the question to you the other way around. You talked about the importance of, of moving up the value chain, getting Kazakhstan to have a kind of human capacity. H how easy, I mean, how diff that must be hugely difficult to kind of move a country from, as you said, a kind of resource dependence perhaps to one where it's value added types of activity. W what are you doing about this? Is this a foreign investment track? Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the kind of transparency that's needed um, for that foreign investment to come in. Um, how are you addressing these kinds of challenges? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we'll, we'll talk about two tendencies. One is maybe for future generation. We start to uh, create uh, opportunities to develop the human capital in Kazakhstan. I'm talking about initiatives to create Western-style uh, universities in Astana and Almaty. So first of all, we have to create the business school and we start to do it with the Duke from the United States. Uh, we start to do it uh, in IT area with Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we start to create the engineering school with UCL. So it's opportunities to uh, prepare the people in Kazakhstan uh, in order to really be, uh, let's say, uh, well-educated, uh, innovative. Uh, in previous period, we, the government paid every year. We sent 3,000 people to the best universities in the world. And they start to come back and to work in our uh, uh, national companies, in private companies, in government companies. And I think so this is like the future fundament for, uh, for the further development. This is a, and we start to create the, also the laboratories, scientist centers, uh, IT centers. So this is like everywhere. We try to create some platform for this. But at, at the uh, same time, even during the crisis, you asked me about the successful stories, not out of the natural resources. We brought the serious investors to Kazakhstan. We brought GE, French Alstom, Italian Fina Mechanica, Spanish Talgo, and this is areas about the railways, equipment, infrastructure, and the agreement is not just to uh, have a joint venture, but really to create a center of engineering, center of maintenance, and this is really very good news for us because it's a huge investment, and this is American and European companies who believe to Kazakhstan. What is the reason to believe to Kazakhstan? Is it's the predictable investment uh, conditions, and the um, new market, which is the custom union, and I think we write. Uh, let's say integration policy of Kazakhstan give us these opportunities to really achieve uh, quick wins in these terms. But in the future, we understand so better conditions. If we be more competitive, even with even the custom union more than Russia and Belarus, the investors prefer to work in Kazakhstan. Um, in terms of uh, opportunities, uh, Snaba, what what's what's working? You've told us for the the challenge that you're facing, but just quickly, and I'm going to turn to the floor in about three three or four minutes to draw in uh, our audience into conversation. But if you can give us a couple of of, of ways that you think things have, have succeeded from your standpoint. Well, I do believe that a lot of things are working. We've seen a tremendous um, innovation happening in our sector in general. Technology has been driving a pace of innovation that I think most industries will have to get used to and it's a very healthy thing to get used to because it means you need to reinvent yourself every five years and if you are not able to do that you don't stay in business that's the boundary conditions we're in now SAP is one example of maybe one of the um, only or few software companies in the world that is not from the US um, mm -hmm. and we've been able to stay in the industry and and take a marking leading position why because we've had a very dedicated focus around innovation, 13% of revenue spent on R&D, but also, and I think this is increasingly important for the future, this idea that you can't do everything yourself. How do you enable, how do you inspire an ecosystem of innovators, of entrepreneurs in, in Kazakhstan and everywhere in the world to enhance what you do? And, and I think that is the big idea of yep. the future. We've seen that can work in the technology industry, and we need to bring that to, to other industries. Um, one concrete example where we're involved is, is in energy. I, I totally agree with, with Connie that we need to find ways to optimize the use of energy. Now, to solve that problem, you actually need a combination of utility companies, um, automotive companies, and technology companies in the same room. We've been facilitating that conversation, and if you, if you imagine, if you tackle the problem more broadly, 
you know, the car becomes a storage of energy produced at, on windmills or by the sun at day or night. It becomes the way you can handle the peaks so you can either generate um, energy and store it in the car at night or you can use it, you know, repurpose it at peak hours. So suddenly, instead of solving the problem of energy industry by industry, we need to facilitate these cross-sector innovations. And I predict that if we were to do that, we actually in this project, it's a combination of smart grid, smart meter, electric cars, and software. We can increase efficiency on energy by at least 40%, my mm -hmm. prediction. And then you have a complete different opportunity for growth without a climate issue. Eva, uh, I'll give you a last quick word on, on opportunities. It strikes me the media, in a way, is becoming uh, a different type of actor now, unleashing kind of individual potential that, okay, sometimes for protest, but could also be in this more positive track as well, yes? No, the, the positive thing is, for example, when you look at Egypt, it was really, it's like we call it already the fifth force, because media used to be the fourth force, so Facebook may be in a few years the fifth force. I mean, it, in the end, it was a whole revolution in a country um, made possible by a new technology called internet or mobile, in the, in the very good mobile there. And, um, and this is also the chance, you know, it, it gives um, a lot more transparency because, you know, like 10 years ago, if there's something was really, really wrong, people could only go, you know, to the TV station or to the main newspapers. If they were owned or stayed near, they had no chance ever to, to get the information out. Today, people Twitter, and if they are like, I, I know some people like in Beirut or in Cairo, and when they Twitter, you know, like two minutes later, the editor in chief of New York Times, the editor in chief of Bild Zeitung, they have it on their mobile phone. They put it before we leave this room, they would put it on the online platform. So I think this is also a very a chance, maybe, you know, like. To, to use information and transparency in a very different way. Uh, absolutely. Let, let me just quickly let everyone know here, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a poll that was done just ahead of this about what would uh, part of the WEF family who contributed to the Facebook uh, list as the keys to unlocking Europe, and they had a, a return poll of about 250. 260 people. Um, in fact, I th yes, you've got it up there. Um, it's so interesting, you can see education and skills coming up at the top of the list. Uh, pretty much 50% of the vote there. An entrepreneurial culture, which I think is um, where you were trying to take this, Jim. It's not just the skills, but how you deploy it um, with another 25%. Interesting to see uh, geopolitical risk and resilience, I'm afraid, right down at the bottom there with one vote, um, which doesn't do a lot for um, uh, those other topics. And even natural resources, interesting, maybe this may be a, a slanted view, but natural resources in terms of unlocking the innovation and growth potential, uh, obviously getting a very small vote. So I just wanted to put that out there as a, as a teaser, because I'd like to turn now to our audience and, and bring in some questions uh, that can be uh, directed at any one or two um, of our panelists, or if you want to be more broadly, I'll try and not have everyone reply to every question. Um, but if you could, uh, there'll be microphones going around the room. Something we haven't talked about at all, uh, in terms of the risks out there, there are, you know, the Euro crisis and whether, uh, as we talk about Europe and Central Asia and the kind of growth potential there, if there is some crisis over the coming years, that will certainly be a geopolitical risk. I think might not that number one vote right up uh, much higher. Who would, um, who would like to come in first and uh, raise their own points from these last two or three days? Maybe something they feel was raised that has not been touched on by the panelists here. Let me invite somebody to come in. Uh, and, and throw a question to our panel. People are going to be quite cautious at the moment. No questions at all. Let me, let me throw it back in that case. I'll keep my eyes open. If you change your mind, put your hand up in a second, uh, and I'll see if I can get uh, somebody in. Let me, uh, where have we got somebody? Yes, there. Thank you. Uh, yes, Sarah Hewn from Standard Chartered Bank. One issue which didn't seem to come up very much in the uh, debates that we had was institutional resilience, and that perhaps ties in with the geopolitical risk resilience. So I wondered um, how far um, the um, institutional backdrop, the rule of law, where, how far these features are seen as significant to um, allowing innovation and are seen as being important to growth potential both in Europe and in Central Asia. 
So an institutional resilience, in other words, inside countries as much as uh, across countries, yes, that capacity. Um, l let me throw that open and let me bring it, maybe Mr. Kalimbetov, raise it to you first, this concept, the rule of law, transparency, especially within developing markets, especially those that are strong, resourcely driven economies. Um, maybe there's a sense that, that one doesn't have to put that at the top of the list initially when Brent is at whatever the price is today. I'm sure it went up after the OPEC decision. Um, uh, where do you place as a government this question of institutional resilience, providing that transparency for foreign investors? How important is that? Oh, sorry, first take Mr. Kenabetov. Uh, yeah. I think at the beginning we uh, try to create the uh, right uh, atmosphere around uh, the issues of protection of uh, foreign and local investors, especially in the areas of the, which are uh, more geopolitical rather than uh, commercial. I'm talking about investors to the oil and gas and uranium area. And if you remember was the initiative of the uh, UK Prime Minister Tony Blair about uh, the extractive industry transparency issue and uh, the Kazakhstan uh, was a, one of the first countries who joined us. So we are trying to uh, very transparently and efficiently manage our oil wells. So we have a national reserve and this is, a, let's say, very open information. Everyone knows where, how we manage this resource, uh, how we invest it, uh, let's say, to the, uh, some social program in Kazakhstan. This is one. The second is we understand this is uh, not even issues from moral point of view, but this is a real competition between the countries. If we, ca if we can't is not ready to get investment. Nobody wants to invest. And investors in Kazakhstan invest last decade 120 billion. So they vote not by the, well, it's not propaganda, they vote by their own money. And I think so this is a very good signal. It does not mean that we are on the same page. We understand that the competition is increasing. And uh, there is uh, some, a lot of rankings, uh, for example, like doing business, uh, uh, doing by World Bank, actually. We try to upgrade our position. Uh, I think we could do better, and we, we try to do our best. And how, just quickly, how central on this is the rule of law? And the rule of law is a big catchphrase, but the independence of judiciary, uh, that ability for contract law, but also um, other aspects of, of a legal environment, how important uh, is the Kazakhstan government how much importance are you placing on that particular issue? You probably know we want to enter a WTO uh, very soon. And uh, the legislation in custom union is very similar to European standards. So it means that uh, all of this European style legislation now uh, to start to work in Kazakhstan. So this is our uh, approach. Um, did anyone else want to come in on this point? Yes, Bosna. Uh, I think uh, in addition to the arrest of General Mladic, the most important thing that happened uh, I think in my country and also in the region was the breakup of a large narco cartel of the so-called Sharij brothers that had assets estimated because we worked on this with the American DEA and the British services of at about 800 million euro. They had transatlantic ships and of course they recycled through offshore zones money into buying assets in the country and the talk of the town was well you know that this company belongs to this one and to this one. The fact that they are in prison and one is still on the run, the fact that their assets have been seized and now, for instance, one of the villas in Novi Sad has been turned into an orphanage, basically. So we have this uh, mafia type of compound now with, uh, with kids without parents. Another one is, is a field next to Belgrade where we're building a police station. I think that though, this, is the, this is the basics. Without this, and then, of course, a, a judiciary that is able to hold on to those who have been arrested, you're not talking about democracy. It's very important for the people to know that the people who they elect are the ones running the country and not some mafia group or some special interest. Uh, uh, when we reach that level, I think uh, the rest of the private investment will, will follow through. And I think after that, we also had a very big uptick in investment. Jim, you want, you want to come as well on this? Yeah, I, um, I wanted to come back to a point around the speed of innovation and um, obviously then regulatory attempts doesn't necessarily accelerate innovation. No? Um, and, but I think it's too easy to claim that, you know, stop doing all these rules. I, I would as a business leader say, you know, as a, from the business side, we need to act in a more responsible way. Uh, and I, I think that's a very important point instead of assuming that the laws will guide what you can do. Why don't you set your standards for what you want to do 
in a world that requires responsibility from business leaders and don't sit and finger point. I learned early that when you point at someone, there's three fingers pointing at you. And maybe that's where it starts because obviously when you have a financial crisis that hit everyone in this world, you have to reconsider, are we responsible leaders in the private sector and what do we need to change in the way we behave? Not necessarily uh, only think that regulatory requirements will be increased because that only slows everyone down. So I think the, the media openness might be affected as well. There's a lady here and then a gentleman there. Let's grab uh, two questions in and together and I'll move over to this side of the room. Thank you. Katinka Baris from the CER in London. Now, historically, a great source of growth in Europe has been economic integration and policy cooperation through the European Union. When we think back to the 1990s, the EU acted as a great anchor for reform for the countries in Central and Eastern Europe that were on the accession track, but also for the countries a bit further afield in the Balkans in the former Soviet Union. My question is to Mr. Djelic, but also to Mr. Kelimbetov. If you look at the European Union now, with the Eurozone crisis, with a lot of bad atmosphere, fragmentation, and perhaps with the exception of energy and climate change, not a big inspirational project on the agenda. What do you see, and do you still feel inspired? Just pass the microphone down. I think there's somebody... Yeah, there we go. Two seats down. It's somewhat linked to the... To the if you could say who you are, please. Uh, my name is Willem van Ege. I work for the World Bank. It's somewhat linked to the previous question. I mean, if you think about innovation, you think about talent and bringing in the right type of talent. My question is the following. Is Europe doing enough to attract talent from outside of Europe? And how does this tie in with the whole migration agenda? And I'd like to get specifically Mr. Schnabel to see what his experience is as an innovative entrepreneur in that field. Thank you. Well, let me first uh, turn to uh, maybe start as you with Mr. Kelimbetov. Let me start outside the EU on that first question about whether the EU is still an inspiration, a driver, a model from your standpoint. And Mr. Kelimbetov, I'll come back to you. Well, I think it's a very good question, actually. I think this is the purpose of uh, maybe this uh, World Economic Forum uh, session in terms of the uh, cooperation between Europe in broader terms and uh, uh, European Union and uh, Central Asia. Still, uh, I think even all of this policy of, uh, uh, let's say, energy saving and alternative energy, anyway, the, uh, Europe needs uh, natural resources. For example, Austria needs oil, France needs uranium, anyway. And in these terms, I think it could be win-win cooperation. So we provide, like Central Asia countries, natural resources, I don't know, mining or as a goods, and we want to get back the cooperation in the area of uh, technologies. But as Mr. Technologies. Mr. Hedegaard said a few minutes ago, um, you know, European growth is becoming decoupled. Now, it doesn't mean we don't import still a lot of energy, but I'm saying there is a decoupling perhaps. We may not be the growth market we were in the past. So again, uh, can we act as a, are we as important to as the growing Chinese demand or the growing demand in other parts of the world? Do we really, as Europe, have that kind of clout or hold over you, if yes, I can use that for, phrase? Yes, for Kazakhstan especially, we are in between Russia and China, and we understand the Chinese uh, economy will drive the world economy. This is big locomotives. Uh, Russia also one of the part of the BRICS uh, community. But anyway, we strongly believe that Europe is strong enough to be real driver because a lot of innovation and talented people and businessmen are working. And on the regulatory side, I mean, because this is the other point, the EU acquis, as it was called, of, of regulations and laws, do you look to the European Union uh, for, for, as a We model are looking for European Union like a model in terms of any type of standards, starting from technological coming to the social. This is very important. I think this is the right model which all the countries in the world, emerging markets, should follow. And this is a good benchmark for us. Thank you. Mr. Jelic? Hi, Katinka. <laughs> I think uh, uh, it's probably fair to say that the soft power of Europe is currently slightly too soft. Uh, <laughs> it's been softened by the fact that, of course, there are internal problems. And uh, it's a bit disappointing to see many years of so many smart people talking about the need to have a significant change in the next financial perspective, only to see now that actually, when it is about to start uh, the real business of allocating the funds, everybody's saying, no pasaran. So those who get money for agriculture say not one euro less for agriculture. Those who are beneficiaries of the 
of the um, of the money for the cohesion, they say the same thing, and at the same time, the net payers say we will actually would like to cap the European budget uh, at a maximum 1% of GDP, maybe 0.8% of GDP. So yeah, I mean, definitely with the, the associated problems with the eurozone, it is a, it is less of this kind of winning club, which is making headway where you would like to join. This being said, it's by far still the best game in town. For the people in the Balkans, this is a giant insurance policy for never again having conflicts, because that's what it was built upon, never again war between France and Germany. In addition to this, there's a lot of very exciting projects from the Danube strategy, the things that Mrs. Hedegaard is heading, where basically it is really one of the best ways to connect to the 21st century agenda. And then one suggestion, therefore, there has been a huge and ever-growing benefit of being in rather than being out. For resources, it means that per capita, young, latest, the new members received 15 times more resources than those who are in the process of joining. And a lot of things, if you're out, you cannot do. You cannot build a high-speed high railing, for instance. You cannot work on the CO2 capture projects. So probably in the next financial perspective, finding a way to more integrate those who are in the accession process will make the soft power of Europe not only soft but pretty hard. Let, let me give Connie Hedegaard a chance yeah, to just, come in on this as well. Just very briefly, because uh, despite all the current challenges, it is a fact that over the recent seven years, EU has expanded with 10 new member states, yes. and I would say successfully so. And also this week, we sent out very strong signals on Croatia, for instance, from the Commission. This is progressing. And we must be do doing something right, because the waiting list is really very, very long. So it's more a question of the speed with which we can accommodate still more who wants to be part of the club. And I understand the question on the, the, the situation right now, but I would also say that overall, we have also used the crisis we have taken major steps in more economic integration in the recent 12 months uh, compared to the former I do not know how many years. So the crisis has also been used for actually getting in place some of the tools we need in the euro area, for instance. That, I think, could be a whole other debate. I'll hold off that one quickly. And this, that, is Europe doing enough to attract talent? So first of all, it's a great question because everything, if you really want to be innovative, starts with talent, education system, that's where it starts. And the answer is absolutely no. And I'm concerned as a European uh, when I see where we are on that topic today. It is a fact that today in the U.S., uh, if you go to the best schools in the U.S., more than 50% of the graduates are foreigners. They used to be Indian people, now it's, now it's Chinese people. And there is a hypothesis that a lot of the U.S. growth in this tough situation is, in fact, due to that historic reason. Uh, so the U.S. is definitely currently significantly better at attracting talent from other regions. Now, what is the future? I spend a lot of time in, in India and China. It worries me even more. You go and visit IIT, which is uh, India's answer to MIT. Um, I would claim the same level of education. Um, there's 250,000 engineers, high quality produced in India every year. That number will go beyond 1 million. I come from a country with 5 million people. That's a scary number. You add the fact that there's more than 520 million people in India, which is less than 25 years old, and all speak English, you begin to understand where this world is going. It's not to Europe, it's from Europe. now. So that's, that's the scary part. Where are we today in Europe? Well, in Germany today, we don't even accept foreign university graduate diplomas. That's where we are in Europe. So here's a massive opportunity for improvement. Now, without, you can't complain without having ideas. I, I think we have a unique opportunity in Europe. What if we could offer the university program where you spend one year in Rome, one year in Paris, one year in Prague, one year in London, and one year in Warsaw. Wow! That would be extremely attractive for many, many regions around Europe that could potentially give us an opportunity here. 
So I'm, I'm missing that opportunity. It's there. It's the diversity of Europe. Let's leverage that. It doesn't mean a platform again for a university structure where you can modularize and combine things rather than compete. Yeah. But it's an opportunity. Yeah, and of course, a country of five million, but in a larger space. And but it is ironic that uh, so few European universities are in the top 200, whatever it is. UK does pretty well, but uh, that's we're now making it harder for students to come in. Um, we're coming very close to the end. I had saw three hands go up, so I'm going to take just those as the last three questions, and perhaps you could target them at somebody. But I'll give um, each of the speakers an opportunity just to say one last comment. There, one takeaway that the, the message they would like to send either to governments or to companies that they want to take away from this from the summit. So if you could make that your last point while we answer the two hands that are there and one hand that was in the middle here. There's a microphone coming. But if it's one person or two people asking a question here. <laughs> I'm from Poland and I have um, only small reflection. I would like to say that in Poland, in, in Europe is 80 million people who are excluded. And I think that it is big challenge not only to think about role of governments and businesses, but also about leader, uh, leaders of uh, regions and local authority, uh, uh, authorities leader, and about cooperation between civic society institutions and local um, uh, authority leaders. And I would like to say that it is not only a matter of creation workplaces, because we have in Poland almost 50% society not prepared to uh, interpret activities and we need special institutions and structures to rebuild human capital and I think it is big challenge and what is lack here I think it is lack of showing also role of region um, leaders mm -hmm. uh, region um, of Europe leaders and civic society institution working together for um, um, to, to create possibilities for social inclusion social integration Thank, Thank you. you very much. And a question, do, sorry, yeah. a question in the middle, please. There's a gentleman there. If you could just bring the microphone to him. That's the last question. Yeah. My name is Johan Andersen from Nordic Innovation. Uh, brief observation uh, followed by a question. Uh, around 1% of the 7 billion people on Earth have uh, higher education, and there we are rounding up. Now, a more interesting observation is that if we look at the next generation in Europe and Central Asia, it's a fact that we are investing less than we did a generation ago in education. Now, if we accept the fact that the investing in children is the future, what does that tell us about our readiness to invest in our own future, that these numbers actually turn out uh, in this end? <coughs> this disperses us from, the, from Asia because this is going in the opposite direction where countries like especially India and China are going oppositely and investing more and more in their education and in their children. Well, those are key points. Why don't I, let me just come round. I'll literally just move down the, the, the speakers, each to make a last comment and address, if you'd like, one of these two points. Ever I see you want to address this point specifically, but why don't, why don't we start, uh, Bozidar, your final message, and if you want to touch on one of those points, either unemployed and excluded or on the education, please do so as you go along. Well, I mean, for the closing, let me be less parochial. I think uh, the, the crisis shook, to, uh, shook many certainties. And I think, uh, as Mrs. Hedegaard and others in the, in the panel have said, uh, that has probably made uh, societies in, in, in Europe and Central Asia more change ready. Not that it is easy. Uh, we can see it with many reformist governments falling and losing elections. This being said, we've also seen more courageous governments actually uh, being re-elected. Uh, which is showing that the crisis is not against reform, it is opening an opportunity to, and I think we would agree around this, really have this further growth which will be resource uh, responsible, to make sure that through this crisis no group is excluded, and I think what is quite important, because institutions have been uh, mentioned here, in terms of governance, definitely there's a couple of important things that need to be finished. I think for the Bretton Woods institutions to finish off those quota changes, for the UN to really come to a change in the Security Council, it needs to be more representative if it is to continue to be relevant. And then at the level of Europe, the Euro governance, uh, the shape of the next uh, financial perspective, and a, a better view of the relationship with the South, which is the Mediterranean, the Middle East and Central Asia, and ex-Soviet Union, 
I think those are the preconditions really for this region to continue what it has been after the Second War, one of the most successful and certainly the most pleasing in the world to live in. So I think uh, it's not uh, forcing optimism at the last minute, but I think it's winnable. It's a big agenda, but doable, you're saying. Eva, last comment from I you. I would like to answer to the Polish lady, because I think it's very important. There's a lot of talk about, you know, education on the highest level, you know, at Ivy League universities. And what I think is very, very important is that the broad mass is also educated better, um, more efficient. And even in a country like Austria, which is one of the richest countries in the world, we have so many problems with education. Um, we have a lot of problems with immigration to integrate people. For example, in Vienna, 50% of the children in the primary schools, 50% average don't speak German. And this is, uh, this is a problem a whole EU problem because the right-wing parties rise and they do a lot of pressure for the governments right now. And I think this is something also that the more developing countries should focus on that you need to educate everybody, not only because there is a lot of problems, you know, getting people to Ivy League unis, but for the broad mass, I think it's very important and it's very often not on the first 10 points of a government for the next 10 years. No, I think that stratification uh, Yeah, of compared to China, they have it on a very, uh, maybe a number two. <laughs> a more mass approach. Mr. Kalimbetov, last comment from you. Maybe two sentences. One is in terms of particularly Kazakhstan. I would like to uh, invite investors to Kazakhstan. <laughs> it's a good opportunity. It's part of custom union, next door to China, predictable investors uh, climates. This is first. The second, in terms of the broader terms, uh, Central Asia and Europe should cooperate in order to improve this cooperation. Maybe we need to uh, discuss and brainstorm the policy issues and the European Union should reconsider it, uh, the strategy in the long run. Right, for that. Thank you, Rush. One Thank comment you. to the question of, of education. Obviously, it, it is extremely important that we focus more on that, also invest more in our D and D. But I would say it's not just a money question. I think here it's also a cultural question. It's, it's a question of, of quality and it's a, a question of our self-perception where I would say we should reward more excellence and we should promote more excellence. We should be less complacent and that would be my re last remark in general because I think that Europe needs to be less complacent. The world around us is changing, it's changing fast and we should take care that we are not protecting individual interests now and by that protecting the status quo instead of allowing for the long-term views that we need in order to make the necessary transition. So there is a difference between what we collectively, all of us need, and that is transition and the long-term perspective and what the individual interests would wish because they will always be defending status quo and we cannot afford that. We need to move forward faster. Thank you very much. Mr. Snabe, you have the last word. Thank you. Well, three simple points. First of all, the positive message is there's so many opportunities. We've only just started and there will be profound opportunities to change the way we work, the way we live with new technologies in the coming years. Um, secondly, the challenge. I totally agree. It is time for Europe to wake up. We're a little bit leaning back. It's time to lean forward. We need to be much, much um, more leveraging the diversity we have as a culture. We need to be much better in scaling and we need to be much faster. <coughs> and finally, my proposal is don't assume regulation will make it. Don't wait for others to try and make it happen. Uh, it's about leaning forward. I suggest this notion of instead of centralizing or decentralizing, let's go for the platform idea. It's proven its power. And I would have concrete four platforms that we need to uh, inspire people in Europe to, to be part of. Healthcare will be a big issue. Let's tackle it now before it's too late. Energy, how do we optimize the energy use so that we get much more growth opportunities? Education is a very key topic and how do we leverage diversity in Europe? And of course, as a technologist, the next generation mobile internet will be a huge driver of connecting people everywhere with people everywhere in much more secure ways than what we've seen so far. So with that last sentence, 
don't wait, take the lead. Thank you. <laughs> well, look, thank you very much to all of our panelists. I think I'm certainly not going to try to sum this up, especially as we're running about three or four minutes late. Um, but I think in terms of the concept of this, this meeting, the Central Asia, Europe, Europe Central Asia connection, Europe may be a little less powerful in its soft power than it was in the past, but I think certainly from what you were saying, Mr. Kelimbetov, you still look to Europe in terms of some of the standards, the investment, and ultimately we're looking to you as part of our future from a resource standpoint and the interlinkages that are likely to be there. So there's still things I think that we're learning uh, and being able to work with each other on. But for Europe in general, I, perhaps I would take Connie's last remarks about being less complacent and certainly not judging our success simply against our own standards and our own uh, limits and challenges, but to look at the world well beyond Europe, because the challenges that are coming, certainly, as you said, from China, from India, as I think we heard from the floor, really make this a, 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 um, a moment that we have to think about very carefully in terms of the future, next choices we take. Not centralizing, perhaps platforming. Um, so with that, let me turn over to Stephen Kinnock, who is going to uh, say some closing words. Stephen. Thank you very much, Robin, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, honoured guests. Uh, it has indeed been a, a pleasure and an honour to have you all uh, with us uh, over the last day and a half here in Vienna. Um, I would also very much like to thank the uh, Government of Austria for their fantastic hospitality. It's been a pleasure to work with those, those colleagues and also to allow us to use this humble uh, meeting place here at the Hofburg. Um, when we m developed the concept for this meeting, we thought about two, ele two elements really, the, the head and the heart. Uh, I think it's very much in line with the European project, which has always been something about uh, a logical need to do what needs to be done, but also an emotional one. I think on the side of the head, um, we, we realize that we need to be hard-headed. Uh, Europe cannot, I think as the panelists have already said, can't compete anymore on the basis of price, on low labour costs, on taxation. Uh, it has to compete on the basis of quality. And if you want to compete on the basis of quality, you have to innovate. You also have to integrate. And I think that's another key part of the message from this meeting. Innovate and integrate. And integration is very much about breaking down these silos. Our sense is that there's a perception that this region, Europe and Central Asia, is uh, almost divided along three lines. Western Europe, what some people might call the old Europe, the new countries and accession countries of the European Union in, in the second bloc, and then uh, the former Soviet space. But I think one of the things that this meeting has demonstrated is that there's a huge amount more that unites us than divides us. The challenges that this region faces in terms of all of the issues that we've looked at today, they're common challenges around labour markets, around talent mobility, around the efficient use of resources. Uh, why we divide the region into these silos uh, is not that clear to me and that's, I think, a point that we have wanted to demonstrate in, that, in this meeting. We've also felt that Vienna is the perfect location in that context, being the gateway between East and West, uh, and that's where we've met over the last day and a half. In terms of the heart uh, and the rationale for this meeting, I think what's clear is that Europe's good at self-criticism. There's quite a lot of beating ourselves up about all of the problems and the challenges, and it's clear that those exist. But as we've heard today, there are also a huge number of opportunities and uh, actually some great success stories in terms of what this region has achieved and what it can achieve to the future. So one of the messages for us has been, let's keep that, uh, if you like, that emotional connection with what we've achieved uh, and look beyond the crisis, start to really think in a more, more long-term perspective about what needs to be done. I think the importance of those messages has been reflected also by uh, the profile of our participants. We've been proud to have here 13 heads of state and government. 100 and over 150 CEOs representing over 40 companies in the Fortune 500. Uh, we've had also, we're very proud to say that we have had over 30 leaders from civil society, including the trade union movement, who've had a strong voice in this meeting. So looking back over the last day and a half, 
what are the, the key takeaways? And uh, we've had a number of them here on the panel. I, I think that I, in a sense, I think you could put them into, into three Ds. I think a, a large part of it has been about demystifying. There's some areas that we've been looking at which have been a bit of a mystery, I think, to other parts of the region. And I hope we've able, been able to take you on a, a demystification uh, a journey, if you like. I think the other key D is, is around dialogue. Uh, dialogue is the foundation for taking action and taking action together. And I think that the, when we talk about the platforms that the, the panel uh, and, and Mr. Snaber in particular has mentioned, I think we've, I hope we've created here a platform. This meeting has been a platform, a platform for the dialogue that is so important to drive the collaboration that we need. And finally, about drive. I think I felt a lot of drive coming from our participants, a lot of people saying we can't just sit back and wait, we need to take responsibility, we need to take action, policy makers, business leaders, civil society need to step up to the plate. And I think, uh, I think as uh, Mr. Djelic said, help yourself and Europe will help you. It's about individual action but also a sense of solidarity. So I hope with, uh, with those, three, those three Ds, as, along with all of the other key takeaways from this meeting, you will go on to collaborate, to continue to innovate and to integrate. I wish you success as you do that and I look forward to meeting you all again. Thank you.